Good evening, guys. Welcome to your first flipped classroom lecture in a while and your first flipped classroom lecture on Song of Solomon. Remember that the notes you're taking right now are what we were calling product notes. Uh, they don't really do anything for you. And then we will take the time to turn those notes into tools so that you can use them when you're prepping for levels of analysis or reviewing for a quiz or any of those kinds of things. This is obviously about Song of Solomon. Uh, we're going to do a brief introduction on Toni Morrison, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of names in Song of Solomon, and then you guys will be on your way. So let's go. To get started with Toni Morrison, we're not going to do a huge amount of uh, information about her. It's kind of interesting that Toni Morrison is not her real name. Uh, it's not technically a pen name because it's the name that she answers to as well, but it's not her birth name either. Uh, and so I have a little challenge for you guys. Uh, people are interested in earning a little bit of extra credit. Can tell me in their notes, if you do some extra research, what her real name is. Just add that into your notes uh, down at the bottom with some extra credit. Uh, just to give you guys something to do on the internet. should not take you long. If you Google her name, you should be able to find it pretty quickly. Uh, Toni Morrison has the very prestigious honor of being the first black woman to win the Nobel Prize. That's a prize given for a lifetime achievement. There's Nobel Prizes in science and chemistry and medicine and in literature and all kinds of other economics, all kinds of things. Toni Morrison won the Nobel Prize for literature in 1993. So a while ago, but still uh, within most of our lifetimes, a very important thing. Um... Not super important for us, but it does just kind of give us an idea of the level of writing that Toni Morrison does. Toni Morrison has said in several different interviews that she grew up in a household of stories and of retellings, where her parents would tell them a story one night, and the next night the kids would have to tell it back to the parents, but with a change added in, with some type of new addition somehow. And this idea of stories and of changing stories is something that has stuck with Toni Morrison throughout all of her work. Um, and she specifically remembers her father telling her these stories. Later on, uh, she went to Howard, the very prestigious historic black college. Um, but at Howard, she actually experienced something really interesting, which was even though she was surrounded by people who looked like her and ostensibly were like her, she said that she really experienced severe discrimination there. And that what you would find is that lots of discrimination based off skin color. Uh, and you would have the light skin versus dark skin and those kinds of things going on. And that that was really an eye-opener for her that there could be so much discrimination within a race of people. That it was not white people discriminating against black people, but it was black people discriminating against other black people. Which is another theme that comes up in a lot of her books. Her first novel... For those of you that are interested, is The Bluest Eye. It's a short little novel. Uh, it's a very, very sad story about an 11-year-old girl who dreams of having blue eyes because all of her dolls have blue eyes because all of her doll dolls are, are white, uh, white skin dolls with blonde hair, kind of like Barbie dolls. Um, the little girl has this horrible life, and this is her biggest dream is to have these blue eyes. Um, it's a very kind of tragic and heartwarming story all at the same time. Um, Song of Solomon was, I believe it was her third novel, and it was after she had told, she'd written The Bluest Eye and written Sula, which some of you have read of as well, and her editor challenged her, encouraged her to go bigger, to do more. And so she produced Song of Solomon, and it's a work that is more complex than her other works. Made a mess down there. It has more characters, and it goes more places, figuratively and literally both. Song of Solomon has a ton of stuff happening in it, and we're going to focus on a couple specific things. One of the things I want to draw your attention to is this picture up here in the corner. Uh, so this is the front cover of the first edition of Song of Solomon, um, and we have these wings on the S's there. They end up being very important, so pay attention to those. That's not what this particular lecture is about, but we are coming back to talk about wings and about flight later on, and so keep that in the back of your mind. That's something you should be looking for in your annotations already. 
I have a quote from a man named Guy Chandler that really kind of summarizes what we're going to look at, though, in these next couple of slides. The novel, Song of Solomon, is anchored in Milkman's physical journey from alienation and estrangement to his discovery of himself and cultural identity. And Song of Solomon is, first and foremost, that novel of discovery, of a character not knowing who he is when he starts and knowing who he is when he gets there. And it, because of that, any novel or any story of discovery is going to involve layers because it always happens that as you learn more about yourself, you learn more about the world around you, or vice versa. The more you travel, the more you learn about yourself. The more you learn about yourself, the more differently you see the world. Um, this is very prevalent in Song of Solomon. And one of the ways that Morrison adds to these layers is by the names of the characters. That the names are both evocative, where they call to mind a specific image, and they are symbolic as well. And we have these two variations. I'll spell that out for you. Evocative. And then the names can also be symbolic, where they can literally represent something larger. Morrison's names come from lots of different places, uh, as you've already maybe figured out in the story. Um, some of her names come from places like the Bible, with Names like 1 Corinthians, which is literally a book in the Bible, to Pilate, who is a character, or a, a person in the Bible who persecuted Jesus, to Hagar and Ruth, they are all characters from the Bible. Then we have some names that come from mythology. We meet some of those later on in this story. Um, a woman named Circe. Freddy the janitor's name actually has a connection to mythology as well, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and then... Also, the names come and arrive out of misunderstandings. Both the family name Dead as well as some of the individual character names are the result of misunderstandings that are then just perpetuated through the centuries. You're going to hear me say this next thing a lot, and it can be a little bit confusing, but names have power. The power of a name comes from two things. If you have the name of something, you can identify it. Think of it in terms of a demerit. If I see a kid misbehaving and I don't know who they are, I don't have any power. I cannot stop them. I can't give them a demerit because I don't know who they are. As soon as I know their name, though, I can give them a demerit. And, on the other side of that, in addition to identifying things, names can also assign limits. If I name something a cat, then it is one thing, and everything else that is not a cat is not a cat. And so, by, by naming something, you can both identify it and limit it or box it in or contain what it is. And that's a very powerful thing when you think about your ability to control people and influence people and individuals and societies and cultures, when you think about how names and words have been used to control people, uh, whether they're racial slurs or ethnic slurs or sexual identification slurs, there's great power in names, and Morrison knows this and is playing with this idea. And so she uses names to signify things about characters and about the places the characters are and, the place, and maybe where the characters are going as well. So every time we come across a character, we want to think both about their name, where they are, where they're going, and who their character is, and does it fit with their name itself. Which brings me to my last. So these are some things we want to be thinking about. Are the characters' names fitting? For instance, this is not a character in the book, but if you had a character named Dusty, and they were a mess all the time, that would be a very fitting name. That name is evocative, that name is symbolic, of them because they are always a mess. Dusty things are things that are disorganized or are not clean and are kind of messy, so dusty would be a mess. Sometimes, however, names can have a contradictory meaning. You have someone named Charity, freely giving, very understanding is what Charity means, and this person named Charity could be very, very stingy in a novel. And then this person's name operates as a symbolic reminder that they're actually not at all like that, that they're missing that positive trait. 
So these are the two most important things to think about in Morrison's novel. Do the characters' names fit them, and how do they fit them? Or are the names deliberately contradictory, and they're reminding us of something that that character is missing? A lot of times, titles can be important as well, whether it's the title of a building, or of a place, or of an area of a place. Um, titles can ring true as well. And then the main question that I want you guys thinking about, that this is, happens in Chapter 1 very early on, but Making Dead, Making Dead the Third becomes named Milkman by Freddy the Janitor. And I want you to think about that nickname that Freddy gives him. It's more than a nickname because it becomes his name. And so we really can see that as a renaming. And how is renaming important? What is the symbolism of giving someone a new name? What is the symbolism of taking a new name? And really think about what that says about Milkman's character and how that's going to play out then in the remainder of our story. These are the big ideas that I want you guys thinking about as we get ready to write our first short response. Uh, when we come back from Thanksgiving break, we will jump into our first short response, which deals with how characters' names are important within the novel. This has been your first flipped classroom lecture. Remember to take advantage of that small extra credit opportunity at the front of the lecture, and I will see you guys next week.